okay so we have set the platform to discuss about the now some of the major equipment and what i say that i am not going to cover all the equipment what we use in mineral processing because i believe that if we understand one equipment or two equipments which are working on different principles then we can understand others also that light because this is not a full course on mineral processing rather we want to see that how they separate what are their principles and what is the research uh, to be carried out further and why the research and what will be the implications of that research in terms of dollars or rupees whatever you say so what we can do how we can better utilize the basic knowledge in particulate technology and fluid mechanics and solid fluid interactions we can apply for improvement of my designs existing designs of my equipment or maybe the process improvement i could say how we can look at okay so that is what we are trying to do but before that i must know what is that and why i am saying it is important so i'll restrict this talk first on the brief descriptions i will try to tell you that what is in literature about its separation mechanism then how do i look at the separation mechanism what are their applications and what type of machines it is what type of what is the scale of operations then i will show you one example that is where the knowledge of basic solid fluid interactions we can utilize to get into the details of a problem i would not say that i have solved the problem but i think there is a crux of the problem okay then tomorrow my phd student will give you a detail uh, research best your description of what he is doing about the hydrocyclone at what what level fluid mechanics fluid mechanical analysis we are doing and why okay so hydrocyclone i don't know how many of you are familiar how many of you are familiar of hydrocyclone please raise your hand okay very yes. hesitate are you sir familiar yeah you are also yeah. familiar of course you are mineral engineer so hydrocyclone if you look at that is it is not that i am biased with this equipment it is not that because i am my present my research area is i am working on that but there is some other reason that why i am choosing this hydrocyclone for this uh, audience uh, to listen to and uh, why, why i thought that we should must discuss this you look at the first patent of cyclone was in 1891 it was a very old equipment okay many places probably they are using industry is using this but they don't realize rather that they are using a cyclone separator they think that that is a part of the equipment equipment but it is a separate equipment okay is a separate device first application in 1914 that is also another thing i want to tell you the young generation that don't get upset that your incubation time for this new developments that is to concept to product it takes lot of time maybe in one life cycle it is may not be possible maybe you have devised that maybe next generation will be applying that because the industry is very your reluctant because of many reasons to absorb new technologies in these areas okay so this is what i am trying to show you here that even it took it it took 23 years for the first application from the patenting so patenting does not ensure that your process has gone to the industry patent is basically you are protecting your idea that nobody else can steal my idea that's it major industrial application started in 1935 so how much is the difference 44 years a single person's your professional career is around 35 to 38 years so who invented that probably he could not see that it has been applied okay so that is why i said that don't get upset if you have invented something and it is not seeing the light of industrial applications at least for this type of industry okay then 
in heavy medium introduced that is what we have briefly discussed about heavy medium cyclone for coal washing in 1939 and that is basically the dense medium cyclone for coal mostly it has been now still we are using that that is started in 1945 at a large scale. Okay. Now, why to use hydrocyclones? Firstly, it is extremely versatile in application. I will discuss all this terminology later. These names are names have come. It is basically the phase separation unit, I would say. Any separation like solid solid in a fluid medium, it is it can separate solid liquid, liquid liquid separation, liquid gas, even two gases you can separate. So, but the design has to be different the operating conditions should be different, but for phase separation you can easily utilize it. That is why it can be used in many industries and it is being used in many industries. Okay. Like starting from your food processing industry, agriculture industry, petroleum industry, set aside mining or processing industry other than this and many recycling industries, power plants, they are all using some form of cyclone for environment monitoring. Uh, uh, environmental engineering. So, it is basically very simple and uh, cheap, apparently simple. When you look at it, you will find that what is the big deal in that? It is a very simple one. I will show you the photograph, but then I will tell you that what is the complexity associated with that. Very cheap one, it is not a very, it does not have any moving parts or something, it does not have sophisticated attachments or something like that. So, very simple one, it is very cheap easy installation anybody can install it, little maintenance in terms of how many tons of material you can process in terms of that. Support structures you need hardly any support structure very little and easy operation these are all apparent. Okay. It means once you set it right you do not have to worry about that it will start working. Less space requirement and high and high throughput it requires very less space and you can mount it vertically. So, your so land these days are becoming very very difficult to grab you know, but it does not require much of land. So, that are all the benefits that is why it is so popular one and very high capacity. So, what is that cyclone looks like? It is simply a cylinder conical body, simply a cylinder conical vessel and for discussion sake and for nomenclature purposes in our industry, we have given different names that is overflow we call it. So, you have got one inlet that is what in dense medium cyclone we discuss that is feed enters into this cylinder conical body tangentially and then at, at a very high pressure. So, you have got a swirling motion that motion is created and then because of that particle will try to move like this along with your slurry, but because of this geometry there is a pressure drop from here to there. Probably you remember in dense medium cyclone we discussed it and it is there are two exits one is from here and one is from here. This one we call it vortex finder, this one we call it spigot or for general understanding you can say this is the overflow and this is the underflow. Okay. Now, what happens the as because it is open to the atmosphere at a critical condition the air actually gets sucked from the atmosphere and it tries to go out with this and it carries the relatively finer particles through the vortex finder a little bit coarser particles they comes to the bottom they come through the bottom. This portion we call it the conical section this is the cylindrical section and the angle this is the included angle these are all basically variables. Now, what is the nomenclature we normally use and you see that from industry to industry varies. In mineral processing we say as a 3 inch, 5 inch, 6 inch, 20 inch cyclone. Okay. So, 20 inch cyclone means the cylindrical diameter is 20 inch only the cylindrical portion. Okay. This, is the, this is the cylindrical diameter that is 20 inch and uh, remaining thing they are all related to that cylindrical diameter. Okay. That is how much will be this, how much will be that, how much will be that opening, 
these are all related to I will show you what is that and what are the conventions and what are they, they are all basically related to cyclone diameter and that is specific to a particular manufacturer or specific to a particular operation for a particular purpose all this. In chemical engineering literature if you look at they are also using or I mean related to environmental engineering literature when you look at they do not understand 20 inch or 12 inch cyclone they say 1D, 2D, 1D, 1D, 3D or 2D, 2D that type of your say nomenclature what does it mean? 1D, 2D cyclone means and then they say D is this. So, that means they are specifying that my diameter of the cyclone is this and length of my cyclone is 2 times of that cylindrical diameter ok that is for the conical part. So, that means you have to calculate what is the angle of that that is your included angle, but here we say ok this is manufactured by this company and this is for classification that means size separation purpose. So, we know they are using 15 degree angle this cone angle some use they use 17.5 some use 20 degree ok that is one of the major variables major variable that is what is differing from one manufacturer to another manufacturer ok. But in case of chemical engineering you are varying it with like your dimension but you are telling the same thing but in a different way. Now, if you look at that is how it works. Now, I will tell you that I said everything is simple, but still I thought that automatically the question will come say so this is such an old equipment and if that is only a cylinder conical body and if it is just tangential entry and going out what is the problem why you are doing research why people are doing research. I would say every year globally on an average there are at least 20 PhDs are produced at least 20 PhDs are produced on some aspect of this apparently very simple equipment ok. And this is the only area where I think many interdisciplinary approaches are being attempted many chemical engineers many mechanical engineers they are pursuing the research even here also we have got a few researchers who are working on some aspect of hydrocyclone. And I think even if you give me the students I can even produce another 100 PhDs with this cyclone I do not need any other topic to be pursued and it is so fascinating because you know the knowledge you gain from this you can apply it in other areas. So, what is the problem here? So, first let me tell you that here the question comes that is first thing is that from industry point of view because of this all these advantages the disadvantage nobody talks about, but we all accept we all know the separation is very fast the capacity is very fast is all simple to use and everything is there, but the separation is very imprecise I am not talking about accuracy even I am talking about precision it is imprecise. That means, if I say what do I use cyclos one of the major application area in mineral processing is in size separation like I said that. I want to separate two particle classes 20 micron and 10 micron below 10 micron and plus 20 micron particle I want to separate. How do I do that and at a rate of 100 tons per hour or 500 tons per hour I cannot use screens the screens the problem is now these days some screen manufacturers are claiming that yes my screens can do that, but that we will discuss later ok. So, but even if the screen can deliver that what you need you need because the just calculate just calculate with your calculator that if I have a density of this particle and they are 20 micron size in 100 tons per hour what will be the surface area we can easily calculate. So, that much of surface area I much say actually need for my screen to separate that now how the screen will vibrate what will be the mechanical design for that, what will be the cost of that, what will be the cost of land and then the screen there are many other issues. So, there actually we use it because the here the residence time is in 
seconds. Here the particle for separation you need only in seconds. It depends on what is the size of your cyclone like 3 inch, 4 inch cyclone the residence time is around less than 2 seconds. So, it just goes in and goes out and we get a separated product with a compromised separation. Now, coming to that your, but how the particle where from the imprecision is coming to make it more precise, more perfect, more accurate people are doing the research and first target is that we have to understand how the particles are getting separated. Now, what is the problem in that? Now, look at the, this is basically a fluid mechanical device, is there any disagreement to that? Because I have to use a fluid medium, I am trying to separate it. Okay? Now, what is happening when I am feeding it? So, I am having a particle size distribution, so different types, different classes of particles, suppose they are all monodensity and then I have got water as a fluid medium. Then the question comes the swirling motion starts, but when it is coming to this conical portion because m v square by r, so r is changing. So, your pattern of centrifugal force changes, so what happens to the swirling pattern to that of that slurry. Then air gets sucked that day some of you visited my lab and had, I, I had shown them, then one question came from the professor that how the air is getting sucked and that is a big question that is a research many people are doing and I say that when the air will be sucked that depends on your condition that how much of pressure drop you have created. Now, which pressure we are talking about? Okay? The pressure we very loosely say the pressure gradient, but which pressure, where, what sort of pressure, how much. Okay? So, Basically, from a fluid mechanical point of view, what is happening? You are starting with a two phase problem, solid liquid, in between a third phase is getting introduced. Mind it, there is a difference. Typical multi phase problem, that is what in CFD I have got the objection with this cyclone, they will invariably start with three phases. But I said, you are not starting with three phases the third phase is being introduced at some condition. How do you put that condition that when the air will be sucked? It is very, very difficult you know. So, you are having three phases and that addition of one phase is in between somewhere, very difficult to understand, very difficult to model it and what happens? It is a high swirling flow, whether there is turbulence if there is turbulence, what is the nature of that turbulence, what is happening to each particle. So, when I have a different size gradient, again the concentration will be different at different layers. So, it is very, very complicated situation, that is how do I do it? How did I motivate this people? A person like Professor Suman Chakravarti, he works on microfluidics. But when I explained him that I need your help in this, he said what is that? He still tells me, no, no, I am looking at a cyclone that process is your problem. I am looking at a cyclone from a point of view of chaos theory <laughs> because you have got a multiple particle system are having high turbulence and all this and think about he is right. Say so, the knowledge if I can understand this even I can use that knowledge in my designing my washing machine, is not it? Washing machine how the darts are getting cleaned, you are putting it into a swirling motion, of course, there is a reverse motion also, but fundamental is that you are using a centrifugal force to dilute your, to dilate your material surfaces and you are trying to force them to eject from your cloth and then that is getting accumulated that you are draining it separately and you are getting a cleaner cloth. So, fundamental is that if I want to design it properly, if I want to fine tune that I have to understand that how the centrifugal force works. So, there are many other engineering applications like flow through nozzles, your engines, automobile engines, how you are injecting. So, everywhere, many where, many places you have got this 
centrifugal type of forces and all this, this is the fluid mechanics. So, they he is interested in that. How did I convince Professor Eric? We are not friends from childhood, okay. It is only through publications and all this we started exchanging dialogues and all this. He works with I said that how the bacteria flows and all. Then I said that look there is a lot of opportunity to work here. So, I have to excite them, I have to give them some challenging problem from fluid mechanics point of view. And at the end, I am trying to extract the essence of that and to apply it for hydrocyclone to solve the industry relevant problems. They are not interested to solve industry relevant problems for hydrocyclone. They are interested in hydrocyclone because they want to understand swirling flow. And it is a very simple piece of equipment where you can do the experiment. Okay. So, that is why we, I am having collaborations with this type of many type of people you know with this equipment. Now, you look at if I summarize the literature review, there are the theories are many. So, the separation theories if I categorize them, I can categorize them into five different categories. Okay. One is very simple fundamental theory. People say okay, there is a swirling motion, this is that is what I said in the, my initial lecture on dense medium cyclone that there is a drag force moving it towards this, there is a centrifugal force towards this and then you are getting a separation. That is a very simple fundamental theory, but the separation actual separation is not that simple. Okay. But that is for my genetic understanding of the separator, it helps me. Then there are some other theories which are basically very frequent in the in uh, literature. One is crowding theory, then there are dimensional analysis based uh, efforts and these days it has become very popular fluid flow model. You go to any IITs or any institute and if anyone is working on mineral processing especially in chemical engineering department they invariably working on cyclone because that is a very relatively cheaper and easier piece of equipment which we can get and then immediately we start on fluid flow modeling specifically CFD that and CFD actually I think the this is the only mineral processing equipment where CFD has been attempted and the literature is growing again it is like an exponentially. Everybody is working on that whoever is working on cyclone he must be having some couple of two three papers on CFD modeling of cyclone, but that is the end of the story. He publishes only three papers or four papers, story ends there. I do not want to end there that is what I say that I am not I will not be happy I am not here to publish papers only. So, but still there is probably we need to fine tune more of the fluid flow fluid mechanics, but uh, CFD can help you in great way in other aspect of this if we know how to use it properly and for what purpose. But the industry they are still relying on models developed 40 years 45 years back that is on regression analysis. You know what is regression analysis? You are only basically input output correlation. At least you have got a large database, you have got the variables, you are trying to correlate it, there is no dimensional stability, nothing and textbooks are also mentioning that, industry is using that, softwares are using that. They are not using neither fluid flow model nor dimensional less dimensional analysis based model nor this. So, this is the present status is that industry is still relying on regression analysis. Why? Now, Everybody knows that it does not tell me how it works, but industry people are happy with the output with this because it is a compromise. Because they are giving projects for CFD related thing other thing, but they are not getting a industrially applicable and viable models or viable tools. Because what happens remember that for this process industry 
any I am not against CFD, but I am saying that CFD when I am using or any tool, any software like this, I must ask first that uh, what is the processing time, what is the simulation time. Okay. So, if I have a mainframe that is a different, but who will give me a mainframe computer for doing research on hydrocyclone? Nobody will give me. Okay. So, the processing time could be few days, many times. Now, our ore changes actually every 10 minutes, the nature of that. So, by the time you have given the inputs to my software and you get a result after 3 days, by the time the ore characteristic has changed, that is the size distribution changed. So, what is the use of that? So, then you are giving a solution, that is one aspect of that. And what are the other problems with that? That is, say suppose in industry what happens, they can monitor with this that is your spigot, they can play with this. Now, say suppose I have got a that is what I keep telling, I have got a 100 millimeter orifice. Now, my student your uh, Sasank, he is desperate to work on CFD, I am not discouraging, but after his simulation he said for a problem. He says he recommends that no, I do not need 100 millimeter orifice, the best orifice is 96.3258 millimeter. Who will make it for you? 96.3258 millimeter, who will give you 96.3258 millimeter? And then next simulation comes, oh, there is a problem, no, no, it should be 101.87. Who will give you? Nobody is going to give you. You cannot, you cannot keep that type of incremental your say your say actually the, the spigots as your spares. So, you have to have some broader increments. So, that means you are making compromise and I say that even by empirical model or even by semi empirical model I can also give you that type of result. So, why should I invest on that? Why should I wait for 3 days to get that? That is one problem. So, the computational time has to be very fast for that the type of software. Okay. So, let me come, come back to this. So, if I look at the simple fundamental theories, there are again two categories, one is called equilibrium orbit theory, another one is residence time theory. And this is one aspect of that, I like this idea equilibrium orbit theory, I have modified a bit and I am applying it. I am trying to apply it rather I would say and initially I am getting very good results. So, what is that equilibrium orbit hypothesis or say orbit theory it says? It says that that is when the particles they enter in the form of slurry initially you will have some disturbance, but after that after one or two turns the particles they get stabilized and they try to rotate at different orbits inside that. Okay. That means, what I am saying that the particles they rotate at different orbits based on their particle mass that is balance between centrifugal force and your drag force. I have tried to apply that concept, but I have fine tuned it in the form of that is how do I calculate that orbit. Okay. And because if I know how to calculate that orbit, I can say that which particle will be going where. Because my orbit of rotation is more than the dimension of this, no way it can go to the overflow because it is away from that zone, okay, because that is the central axis. So, if it is away from that, so then it will hit the wall at some point and then it will come down. And if it is less than that, that has got a probability of going there, but I have to track it till here that whether it is still having within that zone, then that particle is the having the most probability of going to the top. Okay. So, that orbit hypothesis, but these are all basically still it is it is although it is written theory, but nobody has proved it, I would say these are all hypothesis. Okay. Then there is a residence time theory, I do not want to uh, get into that in detail, 
but the limitations of this orbit hypothesis is that takes no account of the residence time of the particles. But in my model which I cannot disclose it here, but I have incorporated that residence time into that to get into that orbit. Okay. And all particles may not be able to attain equilibrium orbits within their residence time. They may leave the system before that. If they are too coarse or too fine, I may not be giving them sufficient residence time to reach the terminal settling velocity and they may have left the equipment. So, how do I know? How do I track them? No consideration of turbulence here. That is again the question whether there is turbulence or not, but it does not consider the turbulence. It said that it is just creeping flow. However, gives reasonable prediction of cyclone performance at low feed solids concentration. It fails miserably when I am having very high solids concentration. That means, in a highly hindered setting mode, it fails to predict. Then there are, I will quickly run through this, there are residence time theories, that is not the purpose of this talk. You can look at the different theories and all this. There are residence time theories, Ritema and all this. Many people have approached further, but there is hardly any success in terms of industrial applications. I am saying in terms of paper publication, probably there are successes. Uh, you might have published many papers, but <laughs> industry purposes, I do not know. I have not seen that. Then there are crowding theory. These are basically the nodes will be with you. So, you can look at. So, then you look at the fluid flow model based on Navier-Stokes equation. Here actually the importance of Navier-Stokes equation for the simulation of fluid flow in cyclone was realized from the outset of research in 1950s. There is nothing new. It is going on for last 60, 65 years. So, do not think that I am using a your say fluid mechanical tool. You are only basically using that tool to minimize your computation and time, but it is being done for last 60, 65 years and that is what I say that what is that we have achieved in terms of industrial thing. Yes, there are some design modifications and all this. Yes, of course, there are something, but it is not yet ready that it is the only solution and time is a very big factor. Okay. Over the years, a large number of studies on cyclones have made use of this complex nonlinear momentum balance equations. Cyclone studies in Navier Stokes equations have been expressed in primitive form as well as in terms of stream function or vorticity. You can discuss many things. Some of these my student will discuss about that, okay, the vortex flow tomorrow. Various studies, the flow has been considered as both turbulent and laminar flow at a higher than odds number. So, many attempts from different directions it has been made. The flow has been treated as both Newtonian and non-Newtonian, both, okay. but and then it could be from purely analytical and fully computational techniques. Types of fluid flow model, I can again discretize it in this form, analytical flow model, numerical flow model, turbulent two-phase flow model multi-phase modeling of the particle distribution like that. So, I do not to I do not want to go into the detail of this, but I have given some uh, kind of your material for you to look into if you are interested. Okay. That is basically a literature review. The numerical flow model studies of hydrocyclones effectively started in the 1980s like your numerical analysis as a solving differential equations and all this it started in 1980 that is also 35 years old. So, the first successful numerical simulation of the flow in a hydrocyclone was described in a series of papers by Pericles and Rhodes. These authors use the commercial flow solver Phoenix. Okay. Then, however, CFD modeling of cyclone separators is a non-trivial computational challenge. What is the challenge? The swirling turbulence, the presence of solids and the air core in the central zone make the flow in a hydrocyclones complex. I tell you this thing that is, when I have a slurry, is it a fluid? So, we are using a software which calls, which name is computational fluid dynamics. So, 
we are assuming that the slurry also behaves like a fluid does it really it is not okay so first thing i have started assumption okay now another problem is that that is where basically the improvements are coming and people are trying to fine tune it uh, many people may argue the sir is not probably aware of the recent developments yes i keep an eye but i'm not seriously interested in looking at this literature honestly speaking because i know that it will basic fundamental problems are not solved like how do you deal with settling velocity here that is what the status i have solved similarly if you look at a, for a adequate model on viscosity for a slurry even i can give a talk like settling velocity on type of talk on your viscosity that is your rheology i will show you that there is no model available which is experimentally validated well and theoretically is also sound still we rely on incorporating a correction factor or to einstein's basic equation of viscosity people will say okay thomas model is there that model is there but they are all having empiricism into that they are not coming from very fundamental <coughs> because it is very difficult to understand that where from the viscosity is coming and all this. for pure fluid is fine but when you are adding particles it is very difficult to quantify them then size shape density all parameters are there so how my cfd is handled so you are basically incorporating some assumptions now even for different turbulent models turbulence model now there are basically ad, uh, improvement on that earlier may people used to publish do research on this cfd related modeling of hydrocyclone using k epsilon turbulence model are very fundamentals of k epsilon says that it deals with isotropic situation but when i am having particles even if i assume that there are eddies how the eddies will be isotropic there has to be an isotropy in each direction what is isotropic that means the flow has got statistical similarity in all directions how it can have statistical similarity when i have particles now there are improvements on that okay but still it is debatable who has validated it okay so anyway so but i will also show you in my tomorrow's lecture probably that how you can use cfd for getting a vital information for your system okay so then you know there are many improvement going on now came the importance of measurements people said that we are doing modeling but we have to validate it now the sophisticated instrumental techniques are being started that is we will try to measure the velocity profile we will try to track the particles we will try to measure the air coat uh, that is we call it air coat that is when the air is sucked it goes out so you have got a like your pipe type of safe you know for air core not really like pipe pipe type it's like this but what will be the diameter of that and all this what will be the shape of that so there are many sophisticated technique like laser doppler anemometry then uh, say your ct scan like your jkmrc then people have started piv particle image velocimetry many techniques you know like your um, say people even say in Uh, so that is a classic work by using some dyes that is you are taking photographs of the how the dye is flowing and then you are uh, saying that this is how the flow path is inside the cyclone as fine that excites okay is a very high level of research that's fine from a research point of is fine but from industry point of view hardly make any change okay hardly helps then you have got so many models turbulent flow two phase models and like that you keep on talking about that but this is not a course where we are going to detail talk about hydrocyclone so normally when we give a detailed lecture on hydrocyclone three days course on hydrocyclone then probably we discuss in detail on that okay for the hydrocyclone manufacturing industries you know then 
your whether you use oil area and or Lagrangian approach or oil area and Lagrangian approach and all this, these are all there in the literature. Literature is flooded with that. Uh, if you are interested, you can do that. Now, the dimensionless group models. You see that this is the again this gentleman's model, that is Nagesara Rao's model, and uh, later on by fifth model. The Nagesara Rao actually did his PhD from the same institute, JKMRC, I think in 1968 or 74 probably. So, he is the first person who thought about that is why we are incorporating correlating only input and output. Why do not we try to quantify some of the operating and design variables in terms of some hydrodynamic parameters like Froud's number, like Reynolds number. That is the approach I really personally like. Okay. I do not like to have a ugly type of your correlation that y is equal to what expanded to the power this, uh, spigot to the power this and like uh, multiplied by this or add to the <laughs> addition to that. Rather, I would try to use some parameters which can quantify the essential flow features. Okay. Like Reynolds number, it tells me that okay, how how turbulent the flow is or maybe I will have some guesstimate that whether the flow is laminar or turbulent or something like that and I can quantify many things with that. So, that is what he tried, but again his model is also having some other parameters, but in probably in industry whoever is coming has come from industry probably have heard of a very popular software in mineral processing that is called JKC MAT. That is the most popular software for this hydrocyclone and your grinding circuit simulations and all these combinations of that. Now, they have replaced the initial Lynch and Rao model with this Nagesara Rao's model, but this is also more than 40 years old. That was 50 years old, this is a 40 years old, this is also empirical, but still that is being used. Okay. And Bruce Firth, he is also it is a coincidence he is a, that JKMRC is in Brisbane and Bruce Pitt is from CSIRO, it is like our CSIR, they have got CSIRO and they have got a research center that is two in a in Brisbane, it is within 2-3 kilometers from JKMRC. So, it is relatively newer model, but still it is a set of equations he has given, still it is not fully, uh, I would say slightly marginally better model than this, but there is many pros and cons on all these ifs and buts and all this there. So, Nagesara Rao considered the following factors like oil and number, dimensionless cut size, recovery of water and then ultimately they has come out with your proud numbers, Reynolds number and all this. This model is presently being used in JK Simmet software for hydrocyclone performance optimization. However, this model does not consider feed material characters like size and density distribution as independent variables, that is a problem. So, you cannot neglect the effect of density distribution also in a hydrocyclone, you cannot consider that it is a size separator, in any mind sample you will have density separation, the density distribution. So, in any model I must account for that density factor also even though I am saying it is a size separating device. Even for a screening operation, you cannot neglect the effect of the density, but that is a different case. Okay. Now, fifth model is a 2003 is based on dimensionless analysis, but it considers the cyclone as a sludgy subdivision process using fluid diamond means. That means, it does not take into account of the particle separation, but it is a sludgy split press. Okay. The issues are the pressure or flow relationship which provides the energy for the separation process, the volumetric flow rate to the oversized flow stream the, like that. So, many parameters you have to calculate step by step and then, but uh, I have not come across uh, some report or some form of your publication who says that we have applied it in our process improvement or in designing and all this. Because relatively new model, 12 years is nothing you know in our case. Okay. Many people are obsessed with older models. Then these are the regression model, probably 
This model is the most popular in cyclone literature. Any book related to cyclone, they will talk about the split model. And what is the split model? This is the shape of the split model. Okay, that is some constant empirically derived. Then du by du, du means is the underflow diameter. Do is the overflow diameter to the power 3.31 and blah 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 blah. I never use this. Okay, although textbooks all they are mentioning about split model. When I say that I do not like split model, people will laugh at me that who are you to criticize split model. But my purpose is to develop a better model, okay, but to understand better to, so that I can design a much better cyclone or better applications. Okay. So, what are my problems, you know? I just thought in 10 years back, okay, that time. One of my students says that how to write a paper, a PhD student. I said writing paper does not always mean as I said that you have to do your own experiment and all this. You can review the literature properly and you can give your own opinion and that can be a very good paper. He said sir example, then I said okay just for discussion sake I said okay let us look at this hydrocyclone model you know plates model. Nagesara Rao's model, Lynch and Rao's model which are very popular. Everywhere they are using this type of ratio du by du that is your underflow orifice diameter divided by overflow orifice diameter. Forget about dimensionless stability, no empirical model is dimensionally stable because du is the basically you are taking a ratio. So, on top of that. So, I said that if I use it and if you are saying that this is a generic model, then du i b du can be maintained at a constant value by having n number of combinations. 30 by 60 is also half, 3 by 6 is also half, 300 by 600 is also half. So, if I keep this ratio same, will my response be same? No. And have I proved that whether du and do they are dependent on each other or they are independent variables? So, there are certain rules. I cannot just divide someone to someone. You have to follow some mathematical rules. Okay? So, whether they are dependent variables or independent variables. So, like that I said that let us do an experiment let me write it in a proper manner that these empirical models have got this problem. I thought people will laugh at me and I sent it to an international journal. Immediately it was accepted. <laughs> Even we are using it and I said that, that we should not use my message of that paper is that we should not use it as a ratio of all these variable because they are not dependent on each other, they are independent variables. And we have, I have given a very simple equation that even if I use them as an independent variable, there is no problem with my prediction, okay? even with my laboratory cyclone, not much problem is there. So, then immediately it was published. I also was surprised that even uh, 10 years back means after 120 years of this invention, you are writing a paper like your of that type of thing of a school level thing that look you should not use a ratio, the ratio can be maintained by keeping other things variable you know, but they publish and that is that shows that what is the level of knowledge we have in our industry. And that makes me interested that even of a caliber like me. I can do something for the industry because I know that not much is understood. So, if I have a will and if I am sincerely pursuing a certain aspect of something, I can contribute because I know that it is a open land. Okay? Because <laughs> so, anybody, any one of you can contribute significantly in this field provided you have a long term goal 
and you have the will and the zeal and the basic and if your basics are right you can contribute and you can be someone even. So, so how do I look at that is now I reiterate that that is even if I cannot quantify now we are very close to quantifying that, but as I said that I cannot reveal that. But if I look at even from that very simple logic that how it works, that is what I discussed it in terms of when we discussed on this medium cyclone that basically from a settling velocity phenomena that what happens that there is a radial settling velocity of the particles because your gravitational force field becomes very weak, I can ignore it. How do I calculate that your radial settling velocity? By using that your settling velocity model in a centrifugal force field. That last presentation what we gave that V into let us say G into V G or, or G to the power let us say square root of G into V G or that correlations. But for that what I have to do? I have to know how much is the centrifugal force at each location at a given design and an operating condition. So, that model I have got it that is in the Bradley's book there is a model for that. So, if I know forget about which model and all this. So, if I know that how much is the g force at each location and I know the particle basic characteristic what is the size and density I know my fluid. So, I calculate what will be the radial settling velocity of the particle. Okay. Now, if I know the radial settling velocity of the particle, I take only the average residence time of the particle inside the vessel, average residence time. How do I know average residence time? I know the flow rate of a cyclone, how do I know flow rate of a cyclone? Now, I can simultaneously I, either I can have a flow meter here, but flow meter putting a flow meter is very dangerous because mass flow meter is very difficult to rely on either it has to be a say nuclear say nucleonic uh, flow meter and that also you have to ensure that there is no magnetic particle there are so many problems with that. So, rather we put a pressure gauge there you know for a cyclone we measure the pressure inlet pressure. But pressure is very difficult to convert it into what is the flow rate because what happens that is if I have a pressure gauge here that pressure gauge does not tell me how much is the pressure due to forward direction and how much is the back pressure. So, there could be a back pressure also. So, I do not know exactly the pressure is because of what very simple way of looking at flow rate you collect sample time samples from underflow and overflow and you measure the whether it you want mass flow rate or volume flow rate you measure that and I know the time add them together. So, that is my flow rate are you getting there or not. So, I can get to know the flow rate of that and I know the cross sectional area here. So, if I know the flow rate and if I know the cross sectional area. I can get the average velocity through which I can calculate m v square by r that is the g force and for residence time I know the flow rate and if I know the volume of this I can easily calculate that what is the volume of my chamber. So, I get the residence time average residence time I am not talking about discretized residence time for fluid and each particle that probably for fine tuning your model you have to do that. Now, once I know that, so I know the radial settling velocity, I know the residence time, multiply it, so I know their positions. Are you getting there? So, I am trying to apply the equilibrium orbit theory, that is the hypothesis. So, then I know that what will be the locational positions of each particle classes. Okay. Now, what will happen? Now, say suppose if I now the variables are coming how does it affect and as I said the particles whose orbit of rotation will be within this that is within the orifice of this that has got a probability to be carried to the top. Outside that they have got no possibility to be carried to the top they will come to the bottom. So, I can 
predict what will be the separation, but how much of that that is a different issue that is what we are researching that for that I must know what is the transport phenomena, how the particles are being transported through that, that is what we are currently pursuing. There also we have progressed, some uh, will be discussed by my student Chandanath tomorrow. So, now what will happen, if I look at it very simple way in this, now can I not tell what will happen to a cyclone if I change this and that or what will, now let us try. Suppose I increase my feed inlet pressure, so if does that increases my flow rate, so if I am increasing the flow rate through that, so I am increasing the Q, my orifice diameter cross sectional radius remains same. So, what I am increasing basically, I am increasing the V i inlet velocity. So, if my inlet velocity increases, my centrifugal force m v square by r that v is changing. So, my velocity increases, so my centrifugal force increases. So, what will happen? The particle which were basically being collected through this, some of this because of more centrifugal force, the setting velocity will be enhanced. So, they may be thrown out of this from this location. So, I will get much of these particles to be collected from the bottom and on the top I will get only the relatively finer particles. So, my in terms of many of you may not be uh, understanding that, but for their curiosity who are from plant, so that means so called cut size will be finer, that is what you observe and that is how I explain okay, from this basic settling velocity phenomena. In terms of that, say suppose I increase my vortex finder diameter, just for example, you give me any variable, I can tell you what is that, but how much if I if you ask me to quantify, I will say that is what I am pursuing now, okay. That is the research, okay. Or something are confidential, I cannot disclose. Okay. Now, if I increase the vortex finder from here, now to understand that, that is a very interesting question I will pose you and let me see that whether you understand that or not. Okay. Even the basically the mineral processing engineers, I will ask this question. So, this is my inlet and now can you tell me any dimension of your cyclone, sir? You do, you are using cyclone. You are was, you are using a cyclone, isn't it? You are working on that. You let me. You tell me what are your inlet dimension? What is your cyclone inlet diameter? Equivalent spherical diameter. Okay, you don't remember. Okay, you you remember anyone? Cyclone inlet cross section for any sir, any okay i will just tell you that you take any dimension you will find that inlet inlet basically you represent it 25 by 75 or something like that i am talking about that you take that area and convert it into equilibrium equivalent of your say spherical diameter so what is the diameter of that that is my inlet cross sectional area now the inlet and I have got two outlets that is your vortex finder diameter and plus pigot diameter. You will find that inlet dimension is much much less than vortex finder diameter and spigot diameter, is not it? Always. So, if my inlet dimension is less than the sum of my outlets, so that means how does it look like? That is, I have got this, that is what Professor Suman Chakravarti study was showing. Expansion is fine, but my pressure gauge is here, that is my situation. Now, does it really matter that whether it goes up to here or goes up to here, that my pressure will be different? Suppose I increase my vortex finder diameter. So, if I am increasing my vortex finder diameter from here to here, that is I am expanding it, 
does it really matter from a small pipe it is going to a bigger pipe how big it is why should the pressure be disturbed here but your pressure changes isn't it when you have you used cyclone have you used cyclone you are using cyclone so when you are changing your vortex minded diameter even your pressure is changing why it should affect pressure basic theory of fluid mechanics does not tell me that it doesn't matter how big is the discharge pipe but it happens is there any fault with the pressure gauge no then what is how do we interpret it in terms of fluid mechanics why if i change the speed out my pressure should change that is the basically conceptual thing that is what i have to look at that is if you, even if this figure you see that this outlet dimension if you add that is much much better than this one but that is when it is not in dynamic condition but actually what happens in a dynamic condition when it is in working condition my inlet is bigger than my outlet why you know because my outlet cross sections are basically occupied by air so i am talking about your water and slurry so your cross section areas are getting reduced so in a dynamic condition my inlet cross section area is bigger than the outlet cross section area that's why when i change my spigot diameter or vortex pointer diameter automatically my flow rate changes and my pressure gauge changes that is the reason so i have to understand that that how much of air is occupying my outlet cross section area so what is my effective outlet cross section area that is very important to know but no literature deals with that even after again with this hydrocyclone literature it is identical to settling literature you can fill up this room if you take a print out probably this room will be may not be able to accommodate all the papers with the thesis and everything but this aspect is totally neglected and that is what i call it that is the effective cross sectional area and that will tell me that what is my carrying capacity of my particles through that discharge and that is what we are presently researching i cannot reveal more than that otherwise take up people will kill me okay so based on that i have got some design modifications ideas and well, this is what they have invested for that is this is how we can modify the design the reasons are this okay so what i am saying then now if i am making it bigger than this vortex finder so what will happen my flow rate will be increasing again my flow rate increases means my vi increases but at the same time it will not work like that way that without changing anything if i increase the pressure the behavior will be different but if i change the pressure by changing the vortex finder diameter the behavior will be something different because i am increasing the outlet effective cross section area so what will happen of course there will be more g force but that more g force will also increase the pressure drop between this region to this region so this has got an analogy with the pump many people may not agree with me that it is nothing but like a pump for a slurry transportation type of system in a pump what do you do you create a pressure drop that is the head we call it so in a dynamic condition the head is created so what will happen because of that more part more slurry will be transported through that so if you increase my vortex finder diameter the g force will have an adverse effect that will so my your say total quantity of material to be collected will increase that is my yield may be increase but my cut size will be coarser that is what you notice similar thing if i have a smaller vortex say smaller spigot 
same thing you are changing the spigot you are changing the pressure drop because the smaller spigot means here the r is changing so you have a more pressure drop again you are having the similar type of consequences if i change the cone angle if it is if you are reducing residence time will be increased but your r you are reducing so your centrifugal force you are increasing okay so centrifugal force you are when you are using increasing so that is where i have to look at that is how much is the pressure drop created and how much of the separation you have created so that's why i said that to answer your question before lunch when you said that i said that you can use a cyclone before your thickener but that has to be properly selected properly run properly maintained you know that is what that is what should be my dimensions of my cyclone what size because that should be not told by a person that we have done it there there so i have to look at my size classes which one i want to separate sir cyclone will be selected on the basis of slurry volume not only slurry volume you have to look at particle size distributions of course because that is what you want to separate so if i want to have a dewatering unit i need more centrifugal force for the particles to come down so i have to reduce the cone angle the the same cyclone what you are using for size separation you cannot use it for dewatering purposes i need a smaller cone angle because i need more centrifugal force to be generated that is the fast criteria should be that is the cone angle what it should be and how much of centrifugal force i require that i can calculate if i know how to calculate the their orbits so that will tell me that what should be the cyclone diameter and that should be the basis of my selecting my cyclone arbitrarily just 6 inch 8 inch 12 inch is not going to work and unnecessarily we blame the cyclone that we put a cyclone it didn't work it didn't work why have we analyzed it in this way and that is how i think the responsibility lies on both i would say more on the user the manufacturer will always dump their try to dump their equipment will try to sell there or why you are accepting it anyway let us have a break